Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. This is a John Audio Tech collaboration video, and I have a question for you guys. This power supply that we're designing, do we want it to be something that we can build ourselves, or do we want to buy the boards? Or are you just interested in learning about the power supplies? <laughs> Maybe you don't have any intention of actually building or getting one of these power supplies, but for those of you who might be considering that, what do you think? I I was going down the road doing surface mount design, which I'm kind of used to doing that. And then I it just kind of occurred to me that that might be difficult for a lot of people to uh, solder or build themselves. And I thought, well, maybe I should switch to through hole. So that's the number one question. What do you guys think? And then kind of related to that, I came up with another, I've been doing a lot of research looking at different parts and that, and there's another company, uh, Power Integrations, that they sell some really cool devices that essentially they take the control chip and some of the, like say the MOSFET, and they combine it. So you have an integrated device. So you don't have to buy the MOSFET and the control chip. One thing that does, obviously, is it makes it simpler to solder you got one part but yet it's easier to lay out the board design the board and you just have fewer components that way and um, you know there might be less issues because of the layout or because of the type of components you get so let me just kind of show you what I'm talking about so my board my whiteboard I haven't seen it for a little bit uh, sorry, it's been a while since I've done a John Audio Tech collab video. I'm going to get on this project, and I'm, I want to finish it up here uh, pretty soon here. So, got to get some videos out on it. And what we talked about in the past, we've I've got a link down for a playlist showing the different videos. I think, gosh, I don't know, I've probably done five videos on this already. But we talked about doing a PFC, Power Factor Correction Circuit, after the bridge rec fire bulk capacitor. So this guy will bring the current in in a sinusoidal fashion. So it's not just one big old peak in rush into a bulk capacitor. This bulk capacitor is a small bulk capacitor, just a little capacitor that feeds this, like one microfarad kind of thing. It's not a hundred, you know, a couple hundred microfarads. So it's a lot cleaner power at the input. Hopefully that results in a uh, cleaner power at the output, at the, at the amplifier, right? One thing it should do is, because of this switching power supply, we should not have any 60 hertz hum. So we should get rid of all that, okay? Now, what we're gonna do is come to uh, PFC stage, and there's a couple different ways I can do this, but this is one of them. And that chip I'm talking about, the through hole part, what it would do is it'd take this control chip and this MOSFET and put them together in one device. The thing is, is there's also an option where it takes this and this and puts them all in one device. So there's three parts, three main parts of your circuit that are just kind of combined in one through hole part. So yeah, that's kind of what led me down that. I'm going to show you that. We're going to go to a data sheet. I'm going to show you this real quickly. Just kind of show you what I'm talking about, okay? It's it's kind of a neat way to do it. Um, or we can stay discrete, you know, discrete components, like we've been going down the road so far, and I can just convert. Um, I think I can convert all that stuff to through hole. So is that your liking? Like, what would you rather see? And then the second stage is the isolation, where we isolate the output stages. You know, we'll have a plus or minus voltage out here. And there'll be transformer isolated from all this stuff, okay? So this switching power supply, we're gonna, we were talking about using the active clamp for converter, which I only showed part of it, it's really simplified. But again, they have a thing where they don't have the active clamp, but they have a two switch forward but essentially it takes a transistor like this, puts it up on top, and puts a coil in between. And the idea of that was, instead of having to have uh, this guy carry the full voltage, you know, having to have like say a six, 700 volt uh, MOSFET, you have two MOSFETs and they can each carry part of that voltage. 
and then you turn them on and off. Well, you have to have these diodes too that steer the current to reset the transformer, that whole reset thing I talked about before. Anyway, it takes both those transistors and this control chip and puts it in a single device. So that's another option. They have a little higher power option, LCC, an LLC, where they take an LLC converter and this whole thing turns into an LLC converter, which is also um, a low noise you know, converter with an isolation stage. It could be argued that it's even lower noise and you're capable of putting out higher power. So uh, a single device would take care of those FETs and the control circuitry and over here, same thing. So what do you guys think? I'm going to show you what these parts look like in the data sheet. Let's come back, okay? All right, guys. So here's Power Integrations' website. And what we do is we come over here, Products. See, they've got Applications, Design, Support, Community, and Company. If we come over here to Products, it highlights these guys on the left side, AC-DC Conversion. That's where we want to go, but I'll just show you these others. There's Gate Drivers to the right. You see all the different uh, categories motor drivers and automotive solutions. So let's go back to AC-DC conversion. Now I'll come over here and we're gonna come down to the hyper parts. Okay, so here we are. You can do a start designing thing. It kind of walks you through design, which is really cool. Um, down here shows, on the left, it kind of shows you a picture what they look like and data sheets here, description and topology. LLC half bridge down here's PFCs so two switch forward okay uh, or here's max voltage breakdown power level so we come down here to PFC and the top one's the highest power guy so this one we're gonna want to look at is PF this number three guy I think so here let's go click on this data sheet and let's take a look at it okay we come to this page and there we go. I want to download this data sheet. All right, so here's the data sheet. Let me zoom in on it. I'll zoom in nice and close. And here's the part right here. You can see it's got the control chip, the FET, and the diode all integrated into um, this device. That's really neat. Efficiencies over 95% from 10% to 10 full load. And power factor is over 0.92 at even 20% load, which is great. At higher loads, it usually gets better. Lower loads, it's usually difficult. So at only 20%, uh, that's pretty nice. It, down here, it says uh, spread spectrum ac across 60 kilohertz. So that is really nice. It helps with the EMI. It kind of changes the frequency a little bit back and forth to help keep the EMI kind of spread out a little bit. Okay, what I want to show you is this is universal input devices and this is Highline only. So we, we want to do a universal so everybody, you know, can use it, right? So 405 watts to 450 watts full power. So that's pretty nice. That's a PFS 7529H. All right, so now, one thing I want to show you is uh, this L package has the bent lead. So if you want to lay it down or if you want to stand it up, but in both cases are staggered. Okay. So that way you have more isolation or, you know, distance between pins. Then we come down here to uh, our description. I'm just going to kind of scroll through this so you can kind of take a look at the data sheet. Okay, I'll pause for a moment so you can freeze it if you like. You got the metal uh, backside exposed for heat sinking, which is really great. Now here's our block diagram of what's going on inside. So we have our con so we have our normal control chip stuff, all this stuff to the right in the middle. But over here on the left, we have our FETs. It shows two FETs, a sense FET and a power MOSFET. It shows these FETs and then we have a diode. So we have the diode, the FETs, and the control chip all in one package. That's our integrated package. 
And here's our control engine they talk about. All right, so I want to show you something that's interesting about this chip. It can change the frequency from 22 kilohertz to 123 kilohertz. And let me show you what that does. Uh, first of all, as the input voltage here on this curve on the right, uh, over here at 90 volts, if you come up here, it's flat. So it's equal to one, it's your normalized power. So this is your max power right here. But from 90, and if you want to go all the way down to say 70, say brownouts or whatever, then you're going to derate from 100% uh, power down to about 90% power. So you want to limit your power during, during these low voltages. Here's a kind of a flow diagram, which is pretty interesting. It's kind of nice to see what the chip is doing, how it's controlling things. And here we go. Here's some interesting curves. Now, let me show you this. This is line conduction angle. So from zero is the voltage comes up and drops down to 180. And then we get another pulse. But over on the left, it shows how the frequency changes from 22 kilohertz to, say, up to 120 some odd kilohertz, uh, depending on your input voltage. So if you're red, the 90 volts, you're going to go up to almost 110 kilohertz at the top of your curve. Um, and then the start green is 230. And it kind of does this interesting sag thing. But as the voltage is really high, it doesn't have to have as high frequency because it's pulling, you know, the voltage is high. So for the same power, you don't need as much current. So the uh, frequency kind of drops down. But in the middle of the voltage, you know, when that voltage is probably more equal to these others, it's it's a max frequency, 120K. So kind of interesting. Over here on the right, it also changes because of the load, right? If you're not pulling very much load, it doesn't really have to pull much current, so the frequency stays low. It goes up to maybe just over 40 kilohertz. But if you're pulling a lot of current, you're going to go up to 100%. You're going to go over 110 kilohertz. And then it shows the peak load. So it's going to go up even higher during the peaks. But the continuous ones are the solid lines. So really interesting information. And this chip operates in a unique way. And I think that's how they can combine all that those functions into that little module. So we talked about safe operating area, um, you know, some protection features and feedback and so on. There's a lot of information here. Here's your output power tables. Uh, if we divide this in half over here on the left, it's for the efficient power mode and your C ref is 0.1 mic. On the right side, it's the full power mode. Your C-Ref is one mic. So let's say we want to go full power. We're not as worried about efficiency. Plus we want to get power. So here's 405 watts. And here's the 450 for peak. And that's using this PFS 7529H. And then the bottom half of the page, it goes into the higher voltage if you have the 180. But we're, we're you know, we because of the US and other countries, we want to drop down to 90. So we're using the top tables up here. But yeah, interesting stuff, huh? Now, so high efficiency, we're going to boost the voltage to 385. That's kind of typical, somewhere between 380 and 400 or maybe slightly over. Here's your block diagram. Here's your integrated device showing your diode, your FET, and the control chip all in one integrated device. And this one is really showing the full schematics. This one is not simplified. And here's this is very interesting. Assembly layout considerations and even input, uh, even your input EMI filter information. So yeah, a lot of information uh, and doctor design. So 
they go through a design process, output capacitor design. Like here's all the different design processes you, you know, need to go through. And here is our heat sinking thermo design. And here's some PCB guidelines and a design example. So this is really cool stuff. Now, you know, they're showing the layout. I can walk you through the layout and the routing and why they did what. Um, I'm also curious. So the EMI filter is over here on the right, by the way. Then the power comes over and then goes into the PFC and the output comes out here. So, so it's kind of a U-shape uh, circuit board as far as the, the path of the, you know, uh, voltage and current. So I'm just curious if they have Gerber files on that. Uh, quick design checklist. Pretty interesting stuff. And here's your absolute maximum ratings. So I'm just kind of scrolling through and pausing just for you to freeze and read it yourself if you like. I'm talking about brown out here on the left. It's a long um, page because they're, they have to talk about each device like right here. You know, on state resistance, they're talking about each one of the different devices. Oh, yeah, this is the thermal resistance of the different parts. So you can see it starts at almost 2.5 degrees C per watt and these devices over here have a little bit lower thermal resistance, just over one and a quarter. And here's our RDS sun graphs. And here's our package dimensions. So come down here, you can see this is the H package. It's uh, 0.653 long and, or, or 15 or 16.59 millimeters by 8.25 millimeters. And this is the one where the leads are bent. Otherwise, you know, they're both staggered. Otherwise, the dimensions are the same. And it looks like they're all in tubes and 30 parts per tube. And the part markings, so this is, you know, how to read the part markings. Hey guys, so what do you think? Hey, by the way, uh, please excuse this mess. This is a class D amplifier project I got going on. I'll be mixing these two videos together. Plus, I, I got some things I got to show you. Um, I got a new scope, and I've got some other things to show you. Differential probes, some multimeters I picked up. Um... So I want to show you those things too. So I'm going to mix the videos up, all right? Uh, let me know what videos you're most interested in of kind of those things, brief explanation. But what do you guys think about through-hole versus surface mount? What I like to do is when I get the boards quoted to have built, I'm going to get a quote for, you know, having more boards built or, or having some plan where if you guys want boards, that you can either just go to the board house yourself, buy it, or maybe, you know, I mean, it might be messy if I have to buy them and send them out. That would double the cost of shipping, right? So, yeah, I want to set it up where you guys can just go buy your boards. But what I want to also do is provide fully built boards, um, unless you guys are not interested in that. But I think that might be a kind of a neat thing. 
uh, is so you can, you know, some people might just want to get the boards, build them into a project and, and test them. They may not want to, you know, plug a whole bunch of parts on a board <laughs> and then hope it works. I don't know. So let me know what you guys think. Now, one downfall on the integrated part is as far as probing, you won't be able to probe and see how uh, the switching node, or well, maybe you'd be able to see the switching node because there'll still be the connection to the inductor. But there might be certain signals like the gate drive, for instance. You wouldn't be able to see that. So if you wanted to build it so you can go around and probe and look at signals, then the integrated devices might not be the way. Uh, so what do you guys think? Which way should I go? Surface mount or through hole? And then if I go through hole, should I use the integrated devices or stay with the discrete devices? So, hey, I want to thank my patrons. Two thumbs up to you guys um, for helping me so I can do all this stuff. And also, I want to give thanks to the people that have hit the thank you button. And thank you to YouTube for offering it. That's just a way to do a one-time thing like buy me a cup of coffee or something. There's a little thank you button there. And I really appreciate you guys um, hitting the like button. That's a free way to support the channel and help the video get, you know, YouTube's algorithm, all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, just thanks for uh, subscribing. I hit 20,000. That was pretty amazing. It's been, been a while. I can't remember. Four or five years I've been doing this. Time goes by fast, but at the same time, yeah, it's been a lot more work than I thought it would be. <laughs> so I'm glad I hit 20,000. Whew, didn't know if I'd make it there. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll hit the next 20,000 a lot quicker, right? So, all right, well, hey, thanks for watching, guys. And let me know what you think. Give me your ideas. I really appreciate that. And if you guys know board houses, I don't get paid by any board houses, so I'm free to use any board house I want. I know some YouTubers, you'll see them, publish videos on about how to do boards every every month or something a couple videos a month probably because there's an agreement i think that they have to do that kind of thing to and which i would love to have that hopefully a board house will offer that to me <laughs> but anyway right now i'm free so tell me what board houses you guys like which ones might have the best deals for uh you know for you guys to go buy fully built boards or just the bare boards um, or even kits. I wonder if any of the board houses supply kits, so I, I doubt it. But anyway, yeah, let me know. What do, what do you guys think? Open ears. All right. Hey, uh, that's why I did this video, because I just want to know. I just want some direction. Otherwise, I'll just pick a direction myself and go down it. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.